In 2013, my now husband and I sat down in a darkened, half-empty AMC theater with a huge bucket of buttery popcorn, ready to watch everybody's favorite action sci-fi blockbuster, Elysium. If you're asking yourself, what? Uh, yeah, that's reasonable. I I'm sure there are some Elysium heads out there, but uh, it didn't exactly make a lasting cultural impact as a film. So on the off chance you don't recall, Elysium is a sci-fi action film written and directed by Neil Blomkamp. It's this sort of sci-fi movie that really feels like it should be based on a Philip K. Dick short story or something. It's not. It's a fully original screenplay comprising a jumbled mishmash of classic sci-fi tropes that it deploys to mixed success, uh, which is what gives it that vaguely familiar feeling. Blazing hot take. I, I don't think it's a very good movie. I was actually kind of shocked to look it up on Rotten Tomatoes and see that it's got 65%. That honestly feels a little high to me. But there is a scene in Elysium that I am so haunted by that's come back to me again and again over the years to the point where when I knew I wanted to make this video uh, about work and how work is depicted in art, it was the first thing I thought of. It's the 22nd century and Earth is an overcrowded, polluted, disease-ridden husk and rich people have colonized space. Well, more specifically, rich people have made a, a very large, very fancy space station called Elysium that orbits Earth and, and sort of tortures the pores with how beautiful and out of reach it is. If you've seen Blade Runner or WALL-E or just kind of generally familiar with the cyberpunk genre, this will probably sound kind of familiar to you. There's an interesting deviation in Elysium, though. While characters like Rick Deckard and WALL-E are not members of the elite classes in their respective worlds, they're both solidly working class, Rick Deckard and WALL-E both find meaning and identity in their work, even though that goes on to cause some serious conflict in their stories. And that's where Elysium is actually kind of subversive. Matt Damon's character Max is a parolee working to survive. He has no passion for the work that he does on the factory line of a defense contractor called Arnodyne, but his status as someone with a job, any job, is important to him. Jobs are scarce on Earth, but money is still necessary to survive, and so this job and his ability to hold on to it means he's not a criminal both to the state and internally to his own sense of identity. And one day at work, Max is presented with a choice. The door cordoning off a radioactive zone gets pinched. The foreman casually tells Max to just go in there to manually unpinch it. But if something goes wrong and Max is still in there when the door closes, he'll be exposed to a lethal dose of radiation. Either you go in there right now, or we'll find someone who will. So Max goes in there. He does what he's told, and sure enough, he's exposed to a lethal dose of radiation. We watch in horror as his fellow workers try to pry open the door before the foreman comes back, ordering them to disperse, telling them it's already too late. Max is given five days to live, and he's fired from his job just as a cherry on top. This kicks off the main thrust of the movie, because like the rich people's space station, Elysium, has these med bays that can cure anything. Although, to be honest, I have not thought about the remaining hour and a half of this movie much in the past ten years, but this scene has really stuck with me. Where a lot of sci-fi focuses on overt authoritarianism perpetrated by the state headed up by a dictator, Elysium depicts a kind of covert authoritarianism enforced not by the state, but by the bosses. Instead of the state enforcing order from the top down, the state is in a symbiotic relationship with these mega corporations, like this defense contractor Arnodyne. There aren't enough jobs on Earth, there's no social safety net, people resort to theft to survive, theft is brutally punished by the state. Sure, Max had the freedom to refuse to do the work, but if that freedom means a loss of a job, and in this world he needs a job to stay out of jail, is that freedom at all? When I watched the radiation scene in Elysium, I felt true fear, but I also felt confusion. Like, why do I see myself in this? Why is this resonating with me? I wasn't working with radioactive materials for one thing. When I saw Elysium in theaters, I was 23 and I had just entered the corporate world for the first time after a young adulthood, supporting myself mostly with minimum wage retail and service jobs. Me landing a corporate job was supposed to be a boon. After years of scraping to get by, I was supposed to finally be able to relax a little. I wasn't working on the line. I wasn't on my feet for eight hours a day. I was working in an over air conditioned cubicle and truth be told, I, I wasn't doing much work at all. But I felt more trapped than I ever did in any of my service jobs because what I realized when I was watching Elysium, what really punched me in the gut was that now that I had made it, th there was nowhere left to escape to. I was working at a job that everyone said was plum that left me feeling miserable and unfulfilled and I was staring down the barrel of the rest of my life. I didn't know it then, but I had what anthropologist David Graeber termed a bullshit job. 
So in 2013, the same year I began to cubicle rot, Graeber wrote an essay he called on the phenomenon of bullshit jobs that went viral. He was an academic, and at his job in the university setting, he was seeing a huge uptick in administrative bureaucratic jobs that seemed, from his perspective, to be pretty much useless and that actually often made it harder for academics like him to do their jobs at all. And he had a hunch that this might be a widespread issue. Sure enough, after he published his essay, people started sending him testimonials about their own jobs that were, by their own estimation, anywhere from pretty much useless to downright harmful. And those testimonials and the resulting interview Graeber conducted form the scaffolding of his 2018 book, Bullshit Jobs, A Theory. Graeber broadly defines bullshit jobs as jobs so pointless that the paid employees who do them cannot justify their existence. They are jobs that do not need to exist with duties that, if they weren't carried out, uh, there would be no impact or perhaps the world might even be a better place. And you'd think a job where you didn't have to do anything would be great. But Graeber observed in these interviews that bullshit jobs were actually taking a huge psychic toll on the people who worked them. In his original essay, Graeber describes the the moral and spiritual damage that these jobs do as a scar across our collective soul. Office Space is a 1999 workplace comedy written and directed by Mike Judge. It's about Peter, a software engineer at Bureaucracy Riddled in a Tech. His days are filled up mostly by making reports that don't need to exist and then dealing with his six bosses descending on him like vultures when he makes inconsequential mistakes on said reports. Peter has a bullshit job. Where Peter's at at the beginning of the movie reads like a lot of the testimonials in Graeber's book. At the beginning of the movie, Peter is depressed, anxious, high strung, and generally feeling out of control of his own life, and he identifies his work as the cause of all that. The optics of software engineering as a career in 2024 are quite different. In 1999, uh, Inatech was meant to be read as a stand-in for IBM, or at least what IBM had become by 1999, soulless, artless, hopelessly entrenched in labyrinthine bureaucracy. Peter doesn't have a lot of work to do, but he does have a lot of bosses to appease, and he and his co-workers need to justify their existence to the outside consultants that Inatex brought in. As Graver points out in Bullshit Jobs, people do want to be useful. They want to provide a value, and it turns out it's actually a huge psychological burden to both know that you do not provide a lot of value and simultaneously be forced to play act as if you do. And compounding the stress is how isolated Peter feels in this struggle. He's attempting to express these feelings to Michael and Samir when we get one of the most iconic lines of the film. I gotta get out of here. I think I'm gonna lose it. Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> Peter thinks this is aggravating. I think this is aggravating. We're all clearly meant to think this is aggravating, but why? Well, I think it's because there's a dissonance happening that Peter and we, the audience, through him both need to resolve. Peter has just been interrupted in the middle of expressing to his coworkers, hey, this sucks. Maybe the problem isn't me. Maybe the problem is this place. And he's interrupted with this really condescending expression of, no, you're wrong. Not only is what you're feeling normal and expected and not a problem to be solved, what you're feeling is actually trivial. See, it has this cute scene name. It's actually kind of embarrassing that you can't suck it up. A few scenes later, Peter goes to see a hypnotist who, uh, yeah, hypnotizes him into a state of complete relaxation with all his cares and concerns disappearing. Uh, this is meant to be a temporary state, but then the hypnotist, uh... <gasps> oh. oh my god, Dr. Swanson! Uh, and then Peter's stuck like... So this is our inciting incident, but it's not the hypnosis itself that makes the film magical. In fact, by the end, we, we've kind of forgotten about it. It's that the hypnosis creates room for this thing. This unnameable thing that got interrupted by Case of the Mondays Lady. The hypnosis lets Peter get out of his own head enough to be able to see with clarity that no, the problem is not with him. The problem is with work. And his clear-eyed state, him not being so preoccupied with himself, allows him to see that everybody's in the same boat as him and to successfully communicate that for the first time. Free from his silo, this powerful reframing ripples out through his community. Michael isn't hypnotized, Samir isn't hypnotized, Joanna isn't hypnotized, Milton isn't hypnotized, but they're each empowered to take action now that Peter's spoken the quiet part out loud. So if we know the power of a bullshit job lies in keeping you feeling isolated, why are we keeping ourselves so isolated? Why aren't more people making art about how much work sucks? Not to butter the bagel too hard, but Mike judges don't grow on trees. 
I think it's hard for most artists to talk about work in a way that provides any kind of resolution or closure that isn't outright speculative fiction. Hell, I think it's hard within speculative fiction, too. After all, as Zizek said, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Work is hard to examine in art because work is an external force to reckon with on a societal level, but work is also, or has become, deeply internal. What do you do is usually the first question you ask when you meet someone at a party. We're encouraged to think of what we do for work, not just just as how we contribute to society, but as a cornerstone of our own identity. And if you don't, and if you're the main character, well, then that's a problem that needs to be solved. And as I continue to say we in this video, know that I'm talking about my fellow Americans, although this certainly isn't just us. But I do think this is uniquely American in some ways because of the legacy of Protestant fundamentalism. The first European settlers in America believed in the value of hard work in life and the promise of a heavenly reward. They believed in hard work as a virtue. And it doesn't take a genius or a conspiracy theorist to understand how the working class, believing in the intrinsic value and virtuousness of work, might benefit those in power. And Dale, remember, everyone likes a hard work. Of course, they do. They do all the work for them. So if you're the boss and it benefits your lot to get workers thinking they're satisfied with theirs, how do you get workers to love work? Or at least how do you make sure workers work without complaining too much? The answer used to be the promise of a heavenly reward, but, but now it's the promise of self-actualization. If you can just find the right job, you too can hustle your way into loving yourself. If you find the right job, if you find meaning in it, you can find the meaning of life. And wouldn't that be nice? Not only are our individual identities wrapped up in work, but work is the rare political issue that unites the right and the left. Now, the right wants more rights for bosses and the left wants more regulation to benefit workers, but everybody wants jobs. And how can you be pro-labor while being anti-work? So yeah, work is a topic so huge, so personal, so political, and so taken for granted as needing to exist exactly the way it currently does, that it's really hard to take true aim at in art. But I do see a lot of art coming at it sideways. I see a lot of art where work is simmering in the background, and this video is about turning up the heat, naming the ways that we talk about work in art and bringing the simmer up to a boil. In 21st century English language fiction, here's what I've noticed, very broadly speaking. Relationships come together and fall apart. People die and are born. But jobs are a given. Jobs are an unquestioning presence humming along in the background, machines that quietly propel the things that actually matter. They're there when they're needed, glossed over when not. And the jobs that characters have, the work they do, the text almost always uses to, to describe some sort of uh, immutable quality in the characters who do them. The characters, especially in contemporary literary fiction, are, are often writers themselves. Their relationship to work often lacks the urgency that actual working people experience. They're often doing work in a way that suggests work is not necessary necessary for their survival. And it makes sense there are a lot of writer characters in lit fic because write what you know. So okay, I was very briefly an English major, but but I switched. And it wasn't because I didn't want to write anymore. I, I quit when I realized that having a degree in English would mean that I'd probably end up writing schlock for some content mill if I was lucky. I thought to myself, wow, if I want to keep writing and loving writing, I better not get a degree in it because career success would likely mean churning out ad copy for Taco Bell. Characters in literary fiction never seem to be those kinds of writers. Personally, I'm a genre guy. I do read lit fic, but I find that a lot of the buzziest, most acclaimed contemporary lit fic to be navel-gazing, myopic, relentlessly individualistic. When I read a lot of contemporary lit fic, I often pick up on this profound isolation that doesn't always seem to be totally aware of itself. I, I don't think it has to be like this because it hasn't always been like this. Elizabeth Gaskell, Charlotte Bronte, Charles Dickens, these authors we understand to be great who were explicitly reckoning with societal issues of their era. They were concerned not just with the individual but how individuals stitched together into a larger social fabric. In The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, first published in 1940, Carson McCullers paints a portrait of a small town in the Deep South, peopled with characters united by their outsider status. It's not a novel about work, but work is everywhere in it. 
Work is discussed with a directness that to a reader in 2024 is quite striking. Every character has a job or is looking for a job. Money is discussed pragmatically and openly, but jobs don't solve problems and they don't create meaning. There is no self-actualization to be found in employment, even in so-called noble work. In fact, McCullers points out the danger of looking for identity in your work. 13-year-old Mick observes with premature clarity how deeply her father's confidence has been shaken since he became disabled and unable to support his family through manual labor. He takes odd jobs fixing jewelry and watches, but he doesn't have enough work to truly keep himself busy. But to admit that fact openly, even though everyone around him can clearly see it, would be humiliating for him, and it's isolated him from his family. Like all the characters in the novel, he's part of a community, and at the same time, he's profoundly lonely. McCullough sees this isolation as the most pressing problem in her work, and isolation is a problem all of her characters deal with, and it can't be solved through bootstraps or by finding your true purpose by way of output. Isolation can only be solved by belonging. The Heart is a Lonely Hunter is often described as Southern Gothic, but McCullers herself described her writing as Southern Realism, which is a term meant to pay homage to Russian realism. In the Russian Realist and Southern Literature, published in 1941, McCullers describes the shared sensibility of Southern and Russian realism as, quote, a bold and outwardly callous juxtaposition of the tragic with the humorous, the immense with the trivial, the sacred with the body, the whole soul of a man with a materialistic detail. So we can trace the lineage of the 19th century Russian literature that inspired McCullers into the socialist realism of the 20th century. It starts to make sense why American and English language literature has diverted so drastically from the path that McCullers was on in 1940. Hi, editing Mel here. Man, I always get in trouble when I try to talk about history. I'm not a historian. And rewatching that last part, I I feel like I implied that the connection between Russian realism and socialist realism is in the word realism, and it's not. It's in the word Russia and just sort of the lives of Russian artists and what they're going through from the late 19th century through the revolution and the Cold War. Socialist realism was an openly didactic representational art movement that served to uh, advance Stalinist ideals. Uh, When McCullers is talking about Russian realism, she's talking about guys like Dostoevsky, who was like extremely influential, obviously, but that realism word is not the connective tissue there. The point I'm trying to make is just that like Everyone agrees The Heart is a Lonely Hunter is an anti-fascist novel. I think most would say it's it's literally a Marxist novel. Marx is name dropped several times in it. It has a lot of great things to say about him and his work, uh, which if you read a lot of American literature, you know that's pretty rare to see. And it being published in 1940, a decade out from the Cold War and the boom of what we think of as modern American literature, it serves as a useful counterpoint or maybe even a lens into what modern American literature could have looked like had it not been so ransacked by anti-communist paranoia during the Cold War. It can be hard to talk about some of the shit the CIA has gotten up to uh, because some of the ideas they cooked up, especially during the Cold War when the agency was in its infancy, uh, were so balls to the walls bananas that even talking about the bare bones facts sounds downright conspiratorial. It's not that they were all knowing evil overlords at this time. Uh, They were throwing a lot of spaghetti at the wall. Virulently anti-communist spaghetti. The CIA's involvement in American arts during the Cold War really came down to money. Using money as a way to promote some ideas and drown out others. Propaganda, in other words. There's its involvement in the modern art movement, of course, but perhaps less known is its investment in the Iowa Writers' Workshop. If you have friends in high school, you might be wondering, what's the Iowa Writers' Workshop? To quote Brian Merchant from Motherboard, if you've ever found yourself joining the chorus of critics who've lamented the surfeit of granular domestic fiction that's dominated the American post-war literary tradition, you've lamented IWW. In terms of American literature, Iowa is simply that girl. And Iowa has a signature style and a signature set of priorities, and its huge impact on creative writing has rippled out through MFA programs across the country, and thus traditionally published English language fiction as a whole. Basically, how the CIA got involved was that Paul Engel, the program's second director, was what Eric Bennett calls a DIY cold warrior. Engel solicited and was granted funding from the Farfield Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and other wealthy conservative Midwestern men about town. And the Farfield Foundation, that was the CIA front that operated as a philanthropic foundation, funding the culture war against the Soviet Union. The idea being that modern avant-garde art 
could be an effective foil against the sort of art that was coming out of the Soviet Union at the time. When he approached the Rockefeller Foundation, Engels specifically pitched Iowa as an ideological alternative to the new University of Moscow. Famous writers taught, graduated from, gave readings, and partied hard at Iowa, and its conservative funding was used to advertise that fact to the entire country in places like Time Magazine, and that hype is what really put Iowa on the map. And the Creative Writing MFA was a new idea at the time, and so the other programs popping up were emulating Iowa's success. To this day, the Iowa style dominates the sort of writing that's considered to have literary merit. And that style prioritizes individual sensory experience. Don't allegorize Calvinism through whaling, Bennett's teacher Frank Conroy taught him. Instead, describe a harpoon and a dinghy. But that approach doesn't leave a lot of room to explore ideas bigger than what an individual can experience, i.e. work as a social problem. And I want to emphasize here that like the art that's being created with this legacy and this tradition is not like inherently bad or fake or phony or, or a psyop. It's both more and less insidious than that. People are matriculating through these MFA programs with real talent and real ambition and are being molded in a tradition that, yeah, like kind of began as anti-communist propaganda and has not totally divested itself from that legacy. So it's not really about the art that we gained. It's about the art that we lost. The experience of actually attending the workshop was to Eric Bennett, who attended between 1998 and 2000, like a muffin tin you poured the batter of your dreams into. You entered with something undefined and tantalizingly protean and left with muffins. Rachel Cusk did not go to Iowa just to get that out of the way. She's British. She went to Oxford. But she's relevant here because she's your favorite contemporary writer's favorite contemporary writer. A lot of them went to Iowa. What Cusk is doing reverberates through the literary world and serves as a useful barometer for what's being seen as good by the people who decide such things. Dwight Garner wrote a review of her most recent novel in the New York Times. He titled it and subtitled it very informatively, The Artist is Present and Pretentious in Rachel Cusk's Latest. Her new novel, Parade considers the perplexity and solipsism of the creative life. Parade is a book about artists, painters, sculptors, a filmmaker, uh, and they're all named G. Garner writes, many of these artists have elite problems. They are accustomed to foreign travel and high levels of comfort. They have second homes, large studios, gleaming kitchens. If describing the harpoon in the dinghy is the correct uh, literary way to write, what happens when the harpoon and the dinghy are on a private yacht manned by the hired help? Normal People by Sally Rooney is a literary novel more interested in these issues than many of its peers. In some ways, class is a central theme. The reason its main characters, Connell and Marianne, enter each other's orbits in the first place is because Connell's mother is a house cleaner in the mansion Marianne grew up in. Connell and his mother are understood to be working class. Throughout the novel, Connell feels a kind of ambiguous guilt about being born because his mother had him very young and without his father in the picture. And his background makes him feel unmoored when he first goes to Dublin for university and encounters truly generationally wealthy people for the first time. Rich people look out for each other, and being Marianne's best friend and suspected sexual partner has elevated Connell to the status of rich adjacent, someone for whom surprise birthday parties are thrown and cushy jobs are procured out of nowhere. Later, Connell loses that job, and he has to move back to their hometown for the summer because he can't make rent in Dublin, the miscommunication around which causes a huge rift between him and Marianne. But even in this situation, uh, we're worried for their relationship. We're not worried about whether or not Connell will survive, or even if he'll have to drop out of school. That's out of the question. We don't get the sense that Connell is materially struggling. After he loses his job, he moves back in with his mother to live rent-free for the summer, something many people do not have the option to do. I didn't have the option to do that when I was in college. Connell and his mother belong to a different social class. They don't have access to the upper echelons of society like Marianne does, and that makes Connell feel some kind of way. But he and his mom have a car. Connell's mother seems to own her house. She has enough free time to spend with him. Connell doesn't seem to want for anything he actually needs to survive. His struggle with money relates to his own self-worth and his juxtaposition to and relationship with Marianne. He and Marianne never talked about money. They had never talked, for example, about the fact that her mother paid his mother money to scrub their floor and hang their laundry, or about the fact that this money circulated indirectly to Connell, who spent it as often as not on Marianne. With Sally Rooney, this absence of money talk is intentional, and I think it's a common yes on particular Irish social sensibilities, uh, but, but it's also indicative of a larger trend in literature.
In a piece for Dirt called Conspicuously Absent, Naomi Kanekia discusses the phenomenon of how contemporary literary novels are haunted by a literal lack of money, even in stories that are ostensibly about it. In Pride and Prejudice, we know exactly how much money everybody makes. Mr. Bennett has 2000 a year, while Mr. Darcy gets 10 But in post-war English language literature, references to money become coy and coded. Specific figures begin to be seen as gauche. Even when novels are about class, the specifics of money, who's getting it from where and how much, are often danced around. Kanakia explicitly marries the lack of money talk with the increasing interiority of the 20th and into the 21st century novel. In Tori Peters' much lauded detransition baby, Kanakia observes that although money is a, ostensibly a driving factor of the plot, we, we don't really know that much about the specifics. We don't know if the characters are in debt. We don't know how much they'll need to pay for childcare and how they'll afford it. We don't even know what their salary are. Kanakia writes, I think this lack of clarity about money arises because the stories literary authors want to tell are, are fundamentally upper middle and upper class stories. Perhaps it is the upper and upper middle class itself that desires these dramas. They want to read about self-determining individuals who are stymied only by their own internal conflict. My take is that literary fiction is overrun with stealth wealth, much in the way that fashion is. Work is seen as so admirable, so virtuous, that, that, that the wealthy are adopting the aesthetics of the working class to bolster their own self-image. It's gauche to be an American and to be seen as a sort of person for whom money is made via capital and not labor. And that makes it more likely that the truly wealthy are going to co-opt the aesthetics of the working class, creating a signal-to-noise ratio that drowns out the voices of the actually working people in their artistic fields. So yeah, I guess it goes without saying at this point that the vast majority of working people are not expressing their experiences with and feelings about work in literary fiction. So where are they doing it? Is this thing on? <clears throat> Posting is art. We don't have time to litigate that today, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. I do have an art degree from a state school, if that helps. So if we accept that posting is art, it follows that there is a lot of art about work on TikTok. Okay, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Corporate Erin. I'm the manager for the Manager of Logistics for Management McManagement. And for the purposes of today's meeting, why well, I put a 9 o'clock meeting on everyone's call this morning. I'm a young professional. And I'm networking. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. Could you talk a little bit about being a human toilet for Samsung? Hey team, how are we doing? Good. I did catch the debate last night. Yeah, well, I think we can all agree this November is going to be interesting, right? So, uh, well, speaking of interesting, can everyone see my screen? No one cares about your job. Your job is pretty meaningless to anyone but yourself, your partner, and maybe your manager. Your company doesn't even care about your job. That's why they'll lay you off in an instant, then merge it with some other job. Most jobs just exist as a buffer because the execs care so little about being involved with the actual work. Like if I had an emergency and I had to call off, it was my responsibility to find someone else to cover my shift. It's an emergency. I'm not the manager. Why is it not my job? What's worse is when I would have those managers that would like require a certificate. I had a manager require an employee bring a death certificate because their grandma died. For flipping burgers? I don't know how working five days a week, eight hours a day for 40 hours a week is sustainable long term. I've been in corporate now for six months and I'm to the point that I want to unalive myself. I'm at work, right? A place that I hate. Obviously, that's that's established. Um, they call me into the loss prevention office halfway through the day. They sit me down. They present a paper to me claiming that there were 13 instances where I collectively, over a span of 90 days, took, quote unquote, three hours and 20 something minutes of time for free. Like, I, I do not want to do this, bro. I don't want to get another job either. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to have to go through the process of quitting this job and then in, uh, applying for other jobs and interviewing for other jobs that I don't even want to do. And I know everyone feels like this, like, ha ha, like this isn't a unique experience. Everyone hates working, but <gasps> then what are we supposed to do? I've observed that videos about work on TikTok can be divided into roughly two categories, uh, blue collar and corporate. 
So blue collar talk, and I'm using that as a shorthand to include both traditional blue collar trade jobs, but, but also most customer service and retail, food service, hospitality, gig work. Blue collar talk is a wide but scrutable umbrella that narrows down predictably by field. So if you're watching a lot of pro union TikToks, in case you ever thought about not joining a union because your company bought a pizza, I just want to say I work for a union company and we still get free pizza. And you're also watching a lot of TikToks about cars. What are some common issues in Ford? IWEs, the four wheel drive system. You'll, you'll soon land on auto worker and mechanic TikTok. It happens once a week when the sun's up and the rain's down. Yeah, let's go. Okay. This video is wonderful. It really does explain why the mechanics, why there's a shortage of them. Who wants to get into an industry where you have to buy tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of tools? As an employee, you're not a business owner, you're an employee. And that pattern seems to hold true across trades and professions. Common among these types of videos is a sense of camaraderie and shared identity. If not in the specific job, then in their general cohort. And that's not just among the trades. I've noticed this sort of solidarity among service workers too. If I'm making Blue Collar Work Talk app to sound like a pretty nice place, it, it kind of is, uh, at least at the top level. Like there is propaganda here, specifically pro-union propaganda, but that can be really useful in this context, especially because like the darker underlayer of blue collar work talk uh, is often documenting or recounting exploitative labor practices. It's often workers talking to each other, talking about how much they make, sharing screen grabs of shitty texts from their managers, story times about walking out in stolen wages, sharing safety tips if they do delivery work or gig work or sex work. I've seen organic open mouth strikes go viral on blue collar TikTok more than once. This kind of camaraderie is necessary because exploitation in blue collar work, service work, fast food gig work is often uh, oppressive and overt. Thought Slime has a video about working at Tim Hortons where they say, working in fast food is like spending eight hours a day in a totalitarian state. People tell you what to do, how to speak, what facial expressions you're allowed to make. Solidarity among workers coalesces in part as a response to this overt oppression. And I don't think we should underestimate the power of just this, just working people getting onto TikTok and talking to each other in mass. Sometimes telling people the simple truth about what goes on at work can put a lot of pressure on the boss. There is another corner of blue collar work talk that I want to mention, and it's the corner that razzes on corporate TikTok. I just don't have the energy for this. I am unsubscribing from this drama. These kinds of videos mock office dwelling softies for being unhappy in their stable jobs with affordable benefits and predictable hours. And I get it. I do. When you're on your feet for 10 hours a day doing the real work that keeps the world running, corporate bureaucrats who sit in their comfy chairs all day complaining about the emails they have to send seems pitiful. Especially if you're the barista who has to deal with these email job havers taking their pent-up aggression out on you. In Bullshit Jobs, David Graeber argues that this resentment is intentionally stoked by the ruling class to stratify these two realms of the working class. White-collar individual contributors like me are encouraged to see our aesthetics and values mirrored not in the blue-collar laborers who are closer to us in pay, but in our CEOs who make up to 200 times what we do. And to keep up this charade that white-collar workers have more in common with our CEOs than with our baristas, we don't. We need to fabricate and maintain a culture, white collar culture, corporate culture, in order to deepen these stratifications and signal to other white collar folks that we're part of the in group. And Graeber also talks about how this forced aesthetic alignment uh, fosters real resentment because email job havers know that they're not the ones keeping things running. Real productive workers are relentlessly squeezed and exploited. The remainder are divided between a terrorized stratum of the universally reviled unemployed and a larger stratum who are basically paid to do nothing in positions designed to make them identify with the perspectives and sensibilities of the ruling class, managers, administrators, etc., and particularly its financial avatars, but at the same time foster a simmering resentment against anyone whose work has clear and undeniable social value. And I think knowing that, knowing that this is a culture created on purpose to stoke resentment and to keep certain types of people out, it goes a long way to explain the unsettling labyrinthine place that is corporate talk. How does one describe corporate talk? Firstly, it is an actual hashtag you can search for. And if you do, the first thing you'll likely see is going to be what I call corporate influencing. Hot take of the day. I like being a corporate girly. When I tell you 
that this job is sent from heaven. You're not the exception to the rule. You're probably going to have to work a corporate job. The number one thing I think I got from two years at McKinsey that helped me land a director level role at 23 is literally this notion of developing biz riz. If you don't know, I used to work in investment banking and while I was there, I used to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the office. It's a pretty broad umbrella of content that isn't really aimed at people who currently work in corporate or if they do, they're not working in the shiny, happy, idealized corporate atmosphere that's being represented in this content because this content is meant to be aspirational. And a cornerstone of corporate influencing content is the corporate demo that stands for Day in My Life, in which stylish people edit together a short chronological log of a typical day working in a corporate office environment. I find these videos is soul crushing to a dramatic a term. I do not want to ascribe malicious intent to the people who make these videos who are probably just trying to romanticize their life, as the kids say, as well as make a few bucks off of brand deals whomst among us. But after watching dozens of them, I find the cumulative effect on my psyche to be bleak. Here's a rundown of a typical corporate demo video. A Stanley Cup is filled. A Toyota backs out of a two-car garage. An elevator door dings. A bag is deposited at a spotless white desk. Delicate wrists are perched upon a wrist pillow that looks like a fluffy white cloud, affiliate link in bio. Keyboard keys ceaselessly clack. But what work was done? I don't know. I've watched dozens of these videos and I've not been able to substantively answer that question for a single one of them. And of course, I, I don't expect these people to dox themselves or reveal personal details or transcribe their work meetings verbatim. But if you're gonna make a video about work, what is the work? And if you don't get what my issue is here, contrast a corporate demo to a blue collar demo. Moonbeams has attracted a huge following on TikTok where she makes videos about working in the early shift, preparing food at a gas station that serves as a hub for her rural community in Arkansas. And I'm not trying to romanticize working at a gas station or in food service. I've been there, it sucks. And I don't know the details of this woman's life, but she's in charge of this account. And listen to how she frames the value of her work. One caption reads, come to work with me at a small town gas station to prepare Prepare the townspeople of rural America their breakfast on Thanksgiving Day Eve. In this particular video, she prepares and wraps sandwiches. She scrambles eggs in a skillet and spoons them out onto tortillas. She loads a new shipment of food into the freezer. She chats with regulars. She sweeps. She mops. She washes dishes. And even though I've never had her specific job, I can watch any of her videos, look at what she's doing, and its value is immediately clear to me. And so is her pride in her work. Which isn't to say she isn't exploited or underpaid or treated unfairly, but remember, she's the creator. She's doing the framing here. We, the audience, can understand that gas stations will often treat their employees like shit while recognizing that the service they're providing, hot, affordable, calorie-dense meals very early in the morning in areas where nothing else is open or available, is useful and necessary and therefore something to take pride in. There is no equivalent meaning in a corporate demo because corporate demos are not meant to express pride or value in work being done. They're meant to advertise a lifestyle. And what makes things worse is that lifestyle is not stimulating or aesthetic interesting. The clothes corporate talk wears, the backgrounds of its videos, the items that it aesthetically values are all deeply conservative. And not politically conservative, although not not that. Conservative in the way that a hotel room is conservative. Prioritizing banal pleasantness over substance and meaning. Corporate talk, corporate media, it will always be conservative. It does not innovate. It does not express itself because it has no soul to express. Corporate art is inoffensive, hyperpalatable, and incurious. And that's why the only corporate talk content with artistic merit is parody content, content that pokes fun at this culture on a whole spectrum ranging from good natured to devastating indictment. Trying to explain to somebody who's never had a corporate job that corporate work is not real. So I actually have a hard stop in about 60 seconds, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Don't mind my appearance. My name is Erin. I'm the managerial logistics manager for managerial logistics, and I'm just here separating lanyards. We have a conference tomorrow, and I'll be the first person people see giving them their lanyard. Now, if we were to zoom out and take a 30,000 foot view of the core competencies that you bring to the table, um, you'll be able to find that work is happening when you leverage the robust system that you've been given and when you give 110%. So the other day I was having a meeting about a meeting and a young man uh, didn't understand why he needed to be there. 
you know, and it just took time to encourage him that there's no need to reinvent the wheel. So if this is how we've always done it, it's because it's for, it's mission critical. It's for a reason. Corporate Erin is great because her content takes aim at how vapid and manufactured corporate culture is. The voice that Lisa Beasley uses for this character is not her natural speaking voice. And yet if you work in corporate, you will recognize it as the default expected manner of speech. And there are racist implications there because it's a very white American way of speaking that Black people, people of color, people who speak English as a second language are expected to learn and adapt, even though, as Lisa illustrates in her comedy, it is an empty and superficial way of communicating. There's another deeper layer of corporate talk that exists sincerely to educate you in corporate culture. There are rules to being in corporate life that are unwritten that you're not gonna find anywhere. And the only way you find it is if someone mentors you in it, or someone tells you about it, or you just intuitively pick some of these up. Because corporate culture is manufactured, it must be taught implicitly or explicitly. On this corner of TikTok, you'll find self-styled coaches who've built entire cottage careers for themselves around teaching you how to dress, how to speak, how to structure your resume, how to write an email, how to optimize your LinkedIn profile, how to regiment your life, and above all else, how to build your personal brand. I don't care what stage you are in your career. If you haven't started building a personal brand, you need to be, and here's how to do it. It is with deep regret that I announce that I have a brand. I've sort of backed into it because I create content on the internet. And when you do that, it happens whether you like it or not. But do I think you should have to have a brand to have a career? Fuck no. Creating a personal brand is an exercise designed to sand the texture off your soul. I think most creators on Corporate Talk are trying to be helpful, if only to further their own personal goals. But the barrier between actually helpful tips for people who need jobs and what I can only describe as brainwashing is highly permeable. Because for a thinking, feeling person to survive in a corporate work environment, you, you literally have to brainwash yourself. That is what leaning in is. You have to rewire your neural pathways to convince yourself that you your career is the sum of your personal ambitions. That's what's expected of you, at least. And there are a couple different ways you can proceed with that knowledge. One thing you can do, you can choose to play ball. And if you're lucky, you might be one of those rare people who is both talented at their job and who actually enjoys doing it. But there's still a lot of work outside of work, because now since you're leaning in, you're expected to shape your identity around work, to build your brand, to craft a public persona for yourself that demonstrates your value add and your passions and interests and the things that give your life meaning outside of work, even your literal family are relegated to the realm of quaint hobbies. If you want to advance in your corporate career and stay sane, you need to believe that. You need to convince yourself that your career is the sum of your ambitions. Otherwise, you'll never know peace. The other choice you can make if you land a corporate job is to say, hell no, I don't want to climb this ladder. I come to work to get paid. I'm not seeking a promotion. I want to do the work I was hired to do no more, no less. You can do that for a while, but you should know that the idea that you wouldn't want to continually advance your career is taboo. It's baked into how performance reviews work. If you're too loud about it, if you don't make up some bullshit about your five-year goals, you'll wind up with a target on your back. If you're not growing on a linear, measurable trajectory, you are expendable. We're hurtling towards an entirely gig-based corporate future. The corporate lingo for this is freelance or project-based or contract work, but make no mistake, it's gig work. And if everyone's doing gig work, if everyone is in a state of perpetually looking for for their next job. How does that change the way that people interact with the world? How does it change the sorts of things we're willing to stick our necks out for? If you're constantly looking for work, constantly looking at yourself through the lens of a potential employer, how likely are you to rock the boat? How likely are you to make a stink if your boss says something racist, knowing your boss could easily choose to not renew your contract at the end of the month? How likely are you to become a vocal advocate for trans rights? How likely are you to protest the genocide in Palestine? I think taking a peek to see how many people are doing those things on corporate talk will give you a clue. In a gig-based corporate future, you'll be constantly competing with other people for work, your liabilities evaluated against theirs, and you'll have to devote even more time and energy to sculpting your personal brand, buffing out the edges and making yourself as inoffensive as possible. And I'm not just talking about gig-based employment. I'm American. I live in an at-will employment state. I could be fired tomorrow for whatever reason or no reason at all. So it behooves me to navigate the world in a way that will not offend or contradict the interests of my employer. Is this freedom? Well, it's not an environment where whistleblowing can be tolerated. This is not an environment where one can safely sound the alarm when something is deeply wrong. This is how evil is accomplished. Companies that do evil are not by and large made up of ontologically evil people. Except for the very top, they're mostly made up of people trying to keep their head down and doing what they're told. Sometimes that's designing a dark pattern. Sometimes that's designing a bomb. Sometimes it's pressing the button that drops that bomb. 
Lakewood by Megan Giddings is a 2020 literary horror novel that's commonly shelved as sci-fi on Goodreads, which is interesting. Put a pin in that. Lakewood is about a young college student drowning in family medical debt who's recruited into a high-paying and highly mysterious medical experimentation program. Lena is Black, and during her orientation, she immediately notices that all of her fellow participants are people of color, and all of the observers, that is, the people being paid to facilitate and record the results of the experiments, are white. I say it's interesting that this book is commonly shelved as sci-fi because everything in it's already happened. We follow Lena as she's injected with mysterious substances, as she's bullied and provoked into violence, as the water in the entire town is literally poisoned. The book invokes in concept Henrietta Lacks and the water crisis in Flint, and it explicitly mentions by name Project Artichoke and the Tuskegee experiment, all real things that happen to real people. Hold on, that's too passive. Uh, all real things that real people did to other people. If not out of malice, then by just following orders and not asking too many questions. Real people knew of and actively declined to inform the 399 Black men enrolled in the U.S. Public Health Service study out of Tuskegee of their latent syphilis, resulting in 28 of their deaths before the program was shut down. That violence was somebody doing their job. In Lakewood, Lena and her cohort are made to sign a strict and punitive NDA. To help them stick to it, they're given a cover story that they are allowed to discuss with family and friends, and that cover is a banal office job at the Great Lakes Shipping Company. Every day, each participant is given a note card with an entirely fictional summary of their day that they are allowed to tell friends and family about. So while their actual day might have included interrogation and forced acid trips, their note card will say that they attended a diversity seminar, that they took an online course on spreadsheets, or that they asked their manager for for a new headset. Most explicitly, the book is about medical racism against Black Americans, but it is also necessarily a book about work. And since it's a book about work in America, it's also a book about freedom. Lena can technically leave this program at any point, but if she does, she will lose the health insurance that her chronically ill mother desperately needs, even though, as we find out later in the book, the root of her mother's chronic health issues are medical experiments just like these ones. So the events of the book are just one rotation of a cycle that continues to spin. Most Americans are tethered to their jobs in this way. In America, it's dangerous to leave one job without another lined up because health insurance is typically acquired through our employers. And it's dangerous to live in this country without health insurance because U.S. healthcare is privatized. If you have an existing treatment that you need to continue between jobs, good luck. And God forbid you have a medical emergency between jobs because you could find yourself in life-ruining medical debt. Or worse, you might put off seeing a doctor about something very serious and that could kill you. That has killed people. I criticized Lakewood when I first read it because I didn't understand the ending. Uh, things got very wavy, very loosey-goosey. It's an acid trip of a book and it doesn't always feel very grounded in its own chronology, which works against it when trying to build tension. It feels like it's keeping us at arm's length. And the last part of the book feels even more distant because it switches to an epistolary form. Format. It's Lena writing a letter to her friend to serve as her will and also a tell-all of everything that's happened to her that she wasn't allowed to talk about under the NDA. And in this letter, Lena expresses doubt that her friend will believe that all these things really happened to her. And since it's an epistolary, since we're reading this as her friend, it's clear that we're supposed to be doubting her too. And at first I criticized the book for this because why? Like we've been here with Lena and no savvy reader would miss the references to Tuskegee, to Artichoke. But I think I was wrong. I, I don't think that's what's happening. I, I don't think we're supposed to feel doubt that these things really happened to Lena. I, I think we're supposed to feel incredulity that she chose to remain in spite of it. But of course she did. What other choice did she have? I've been reading a lot of sports romance this year, and if you've never dabbled, I'd forgive you for thinking that sports romance is just a venue for readers to play out fantasies of wealth and fame, and it certainly can be. But I've consistently found that the smartest and most subversive sports romance novels have a lot to say about work. Because, of course, it's a requirement of the subgenre. Professional athletes are first and foremost workers, and like a lot of physical labor, it's work with a looming expiration date. The knowledge of the physical limitations of your body is a constant, tangible presence. Thrown Off the Ice by Taylor Fitzpatrick is a 2018 indie novel about a long-term romantic relationship between two semi-closeted professional hockey players. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to be talking about this one in detail. This novel is written for an audience of romance readers with respect and love for the genre, but there is some debate about whether or not it's a true genre romance because one of the key constraints of genre romance is it must have an HEA, happily ever after. 
and if thrown off the ice after a long struggle with degenerative neurological disease directly caused by the multiple concussions he sustained over the course of his hockey career, one of the lead characters, Mike, dies. It doesn't happen on page, it happens between the last chapter and the epilogue, but we know it's coming. We've been painfully bracing for it. Mike's Parkinson's diagnosis happens midway through and it hangs like the sort of Damocles over the rest of the book because Parkinson's is degenerative. It only gets worse. It's just a question of how much worse and for how much longer. The meat of the romance, the conflict that Mike and Liam must navigate together, is getting to a point where Mike, gruff and stoic and independent to a fault, is able to accept that he is worthy of love as a disabled person with a degenerative disease. It's getting him to a place where he allows himself to accept help from the people who love him. The book is a romance novel because his partner Liam's answer to that question is unequivocal and he spends the second half of the book putting his money where his mouth is. We know they stayed together till the end because the epilogue is Liam's eulogy of Mike. So the book's sad ending is not an indictment of the idea of a happily ever after. It's not a criticism of romance. It's an indictment of professional sports because Mike made it. He worked hard, he became a professional hockey player, he earned both tremendous financial success and the unequivocal respect of his colleagues. He achieved the sort of pipe dream that's usually framed as a hopeful, aspirational story and as a testament to what hardworking people can accomplish through perseverance and skill. Look at this, kids. Mike worked really hard and he got his dream job. He was really good at it and it killed him. At first, the fear that Elysium drew out in me felt like an abstraction, but the more I thought about it, the more I researched and wrote the script for this project, the more I realized that that fear was literal. In his 1985 essay, The Abolition of Work, Bob Black writes, directly or indirectly, work will kill most of the people who read these words. Between 14,000 and 25,000 workers are killed annually in this country on the job. Over 2 million are disabled, 20 to 25 million are injured every year. And those numbers don't account for occupational disease like black lung or the chronic conditions that many professional athletes suffer from, but expand it out even more. Like, do you know someone who's worked themselves to death? Because I do. And that's not reflected in those numbers. Those numbers don't account for car accidents that only happen because people are driving to or from work, which is most people driving. Those numbers don't account for deaths relating to substance abuse that manifest only because people need a way to cope with the stress of work. And of course, those numbers are from 1985, so they're not counting the now impossible to know number of people who have become permanently disabled or died because they contracted COVID at work. Work will kill you. If you're a person with any kind of active creative practice, you went into this video probably already know when the work sucks. We're encouraged to accept that early on and work on our creative passions in our free time. So as I'm telling you this, I have two jobs. I've got my full-time job that pays the bills, knock on wood, and also my creative work, which is what you're seeing right here. My strand of creative work, writing, is solo and entrepreneurial by nature. There are a lot of kinds of creative work, like making video games, for example, that really needs to be done as part of a team. And if you're very good at what you do, if you work very hard, if you have that magical cocktail of talent, discipline, and ambition, uh, you might be hired on by a game studio or by a design team or a high-end fashion house, or you might be hired as an actor in a film or doing some other kind of collaborative creative work. Some people work their entire lives to achieve dream careers in the arts, and they get to be some of the lucky few who earn a living materializing creative ideas through craft, arguably the thing that humans are meant to do. The main characters in Gabrielle Zevin's 2022 novel Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow are video game design who make it big. Best friends Sadie and Sam make an indie game that's an unexpected smash hit, and they're able to funnel their success into starting their own game company, and they get to be the bosses of it. They are not forced to disentangle their creative and career ambitions. To them, one begets the other. There are cost-benefit analyses to be done, there are compromises to make and risks to take, but at the end of the day, they get to make what they want, and they get to use their hired team of the best and brightest designers, writers, and engineers to execute their vision. The book is really not about those people. But me being me, I couldn't stop thinking about them while I was reading it. At my day job, I'm a designer. I design software. I am a tool to be utilized. I get a say in how I make things, but not in what I make. And that's usually how it goes. If you're a creative professional, your work is done to execute someone else's vision. Or worse, maybe you had a good idea and you pitched it and your company liked it. Maybe they actually built it. Maybe you poured your blood, sweat, and tears into it. But now that it exists, it belongs to your company. You just 
work here. One of the most harrowing pieces of art I've ever seen made about work, specifically creative work, is actually nonfiction. It's from a documentary miniseries called Double Fine Psych Odyssey. Double Fine is a game studio who released their flagship Psychonauts game in 2005, and the documentary series chronicles the making of its sequel 10 years later. And during the making of this docuseries, Double Fine, which had been an independent studio, was acquired by Microsoft. And I'm not a gamer. I am not involved in this community. There are gears turning and interpersonal relationships here and internal logic that I'm just not privy to. But I don't think you need to be an insider to understand the clip I'm about to show you and to recognize the dawning horror on the faces of the people who signed on to an independent team that purported to prioritize its human talent, only to be told by some corporate ghoul that ideas that had been pitched and rejected to the studio, once voiced aloud, no longer belong to the people who pitched them even if the studio doesn't make the game. So, okay, backing up a bit. Uh, the clip begins with Matt Booty, who, who's the head of Xbox Game Studios, listing off his video game making bona fides. And after making some noise about how he wants to change the studio as little as possible, which is like empty corporate speak meant to keep people from panicking, he segues into the subject of moonlighting. That is, personal creative projects that team members work on privately on their own machines outside of working hours. One of the things, and then we can just open it up to questions, but I just want to address one thing because it kept coming up. I was surprised to hear how much the moonlighting topic came up. So I wanted to just like address that one head on. This is a corporate way of expressing displeasure. Aren't we glad we watched so many corporate talk videos and we can decode this? Where the moonlighting only really starts to be something that we even really need to have a conversation about is if you are making something that directly competes or conflicts with what happens here. And that really is going to boil down to making a game. So that might sound reasonable on its face, but he's telling a room full of artists whose medium is video games. He, he's saying that they're making video games outside of work is a problem that can get them sued by their own employer. The reality is that once something is kind of in these walls, it double fine owns it, right? I don't wear that comes to conflict a little bit is where we're doing some new Fortnite pitch. Yep. So we have always, as a company said, that we don't own the ideas until we actually produce them in the Amnesia Fortnite game jam. But before people submit them, they work on them in their own time, on their own computers, and they do, at some point, tell the ideas. And a lot of them don't get selected, and we've always maintained that we don't own those. Yeah, we're going to have to sort through that, because I don't know, someday down the road we might want to go back and say, ha. That was a great idea, you know? We should go make that game. If an employee dares to want to express themselves outside the confines of their paid employment, here's Matt Booty's solution. So if you really want to go run a startup, quit and go run a startup, right? Wow, I wonder why they didn't think of that. But he's referring specifically to pitched ideas that have been rejected. Historically at Double Fine, once an employee brought an idea to the whiteboard that the team decided not to pursue, it was still their idea that they could do what they wanted with. But here, Matt Booty is saying, not so fast. Uh, even though we're probably not going to do anything with it, you actually can't either because you bringing the idea up at all at work ceded the IP to us. It it it's hard for me to over state the bottomless greed on display here. Every artist with any kind of productive practice knows that ideas are dirt cheap. It's making the thing that matters. It's making the thing that makes it art. Matt Booty would rather lock up that cheap idea in a vault for a thousand years than have you make the world a slightly more beautiful place by doing the actual work of molding it into existence. And if you still want to make art outside of your job, have you considered that you are a disloyal employee and possibly a bad person? When I talk about this documentary being a brilliant and harrowing piece of art, I'm talking specifically about this right here, the camera person panning to the employee's reactions as Matt Booty blathers on. Uh, I feel like I can see the phases of grief flashing across their faces as they listen to the sound of their dreams being flushed down the drain. At work, we know that our bodies do not belong to us, but it, it turns out neither do our minds. If we're going based off a number of concerts attended or number of streams, my favorite musical artist by pretty much any measure I can think of has got to be Jason Isbell. He's a singer-songwriter, formerly of the Drive-By Truckers, often solo, these days usually with the 400 unit. And if you're just reading about him online, you'll see a lot of words from music journalists like Americana and Roots Music and Outlaw Country and even something called Y Alternative. These always read to me as attempts to distance Jason Isbell from country music, which is uh, misguided. The Drive-By 
Truckers were and are more of a Southern rock group, but the most famous songs Jason Isbell wrote for them, Decoration Day, Outfit, and TVA. The Drive By Truckers turned up the rock, but if you listen to Isbell perform those songs solo, you can hear in the architecture and the lyrical content that they are wholeheartedly country songs exploring classic country themes. Decoration Day is a familial saga of multi-generational violence, and TVA, well, TVA refers to the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a federally owned corporation that provides power to a huge swath of the South, among other things. It was part of FDR's New Deal, and it was tasked with revitalizing an area of the country that was particularly hard hit by the Great Depression. And so in the song TVA, the narrator reflects on his childhood, acknowledging that his way of life in this part of the country at this time was only possible because of this New Deal policy and the jobs it provided. And then there's Outfit. So Outfit takes the form of fatherly advice dispensed to his son, but it's not patronizing. It's a device for the father to reflect on his own mistakes and misaligned priorities. My favorite part of the song is the second verse, and it goes like this. Five years in St. Laurie found They call industrial park I worked hospital maintenance Took classes at tech school To memorize frigid air parts But I got to miss your mama And I got to miss you too so I went back to pain for my old man, and I guess that's what I'll always do. Isbell's music walks the line between wholeheartedly inhabiting the deeply working class values and aesthetics of country music while also criticizing both them and the conditions that led to them. Nowhere is this more apparent than in Something More Than Free, the title track off his 2015 solo record, which reads like a darker, less idealistic spin on TVA. Almost like instead of the grandson reflecting on, on all that his grandfather's hard work was able to afford their family, Something More Than Free reads like it's told from the perspective of a man who, who actually did that grueling manual labor the song opens like this when i get home from work i'll call up all my friends and we'll go bust up something beautiful we'll have to build again when i get home from work i'll wrestle off my clothes and leave them right inside the front door because nobody's home to know you see the hammer finds a nail And the freight train needs a race And I'm doing what I'm on this earth to do And I don't think on why I'm here or where it hurts I'm just lucky to have the work Sunday morning I'm too tired to go to church but I thank God for the word. So this narrator actually can't be the TVA narrator's grandfather because this narrator doesn't have a family. He has neither the time nor the energy for one. He lives alone and the only outlets he has to unwind from work are, are destructive ones. And yet the song is structured around this eerie language of gratitude. Like his Protestant forebears, the narrator attempts to find solace in the fact that work is available and that he is able to do it. But there's a bitter aftertaste to that gratitude. It, it feels like he's saying the words, but he doesn't quite believe them. But he's been taught, like I was taught growing up, that abundant work is a thing to be grateful for and that hard work is a virtue. Hard work is supposed to be the price you pay for a life that you love, a life that has impact and meaning. But when the narrator takes stock of his life, he sees nothing there but hard work and the destructive habits he's adopted to cope with it. And so, again, like his Protestant forebears, he tries to content himself with the promise of a heavenly reward, but he still doesn't seem to quite believe his own words. And that unsettles him and it unsettles us too. And I don't think on why I'm here where it hurts. I'm just lucky to have the work. And every night I dream I'm drowning in the dirt. But I thank God for the work.
I'm sorry to tell you this, but in the scope of this video, we are not going to solve the problem of work, which is killing us in body and spirit. But there are people who have interesting ideas about how we could. One I've already mentioned is Bob Black, and he wrote this. At present, most work is useless or worse, and we should simply get rid of it. On the other hand, and I think this the crux of the matter in the revolutionary new departure, we have to take what useful work remains and transform it into a pleasing variety of game-like and craft-like pastimes, indistinguishable from other pleasurable pastimes except that they happen to yield useful end products. Then the artificial barriers of power and property could come down, creation could become recreation, and we could all stop being afraid of each other. I don't suggest that most work is salvageable in this way, but then most work isn't worth trying to save. In this video we've mostly just been talking about how work is represented in art and not about the facts of work or what even work is or how much of what we call work just flat out doesn't need to be done and only exists to create more work, which both Bob Black and David Graeber talk about in their essay and book respectively. And without having already read those, that quote I just read like might sound kind of radical, and it is, but I think it starts to make a lot more sense once you dismantle the erroneous idea that if people weren't forced to go to work in exchange for money to survive, that everyone would just bed rot all day. That idea is fundamentally at odds with my experiences both with work and with humanity. I think that's a worldview that misunderstands what truly motivates people. I don't have a bullshit job anymore by David Graeber's death. Definition. At my day job, I, I do feel like I contribute something worthwhile to my organization. I'd go so far as to say I even like my job as much as a person reasonably could, but I don't find my work particularly worthwhile relative to the huge amount of time and creative energy I pour into it. What I resent about my job is not what I do. It's the fact that in order to keep a roof over my head, in order to be able to go to the doctor when I'm sick, I am required to do it for 40 hours a week, and I don't have any say over the specifics, nor do I have any kind of claim on the product that I make. I'm told what to do, I turn it into my boss, and my identity is scrubbed from it. I am a tool to be utilized at the discretion of the company that I work for. If I didn't have to work for a living, would I still clock in to my current job and proceed as if I were still getting paid? No, I would not. But that doesn't mean I wouldn't want to work at all. The most meaningful work I've done in my life, the work I'm the proudest of, things I've done for my friends and family when they needed help, cooking meals, cleaning their houses, doing their laundry, weeding their vegetable beds, tending to them when they're sick, making videos on the internet that give people light bulb moments. All of that work I've willingly and happily done for free. And I mourn what else I could be doing that is meaningful, that does enrich my community, that does truly need to be done, that I could take ownership of and pride in, in a world where I'm not left so drained at the end of the day by my full-time day job. None of those things I mentioned that I've done for my friends and family would I want to do for 40 hours a week every week for the rest of my life. But in a world without paid work, I wouldn't need to. Most people want to do things. They want to contribute. They want to positively impact their environment. It's just that, as Andrewism says in his video on anti-work, most people have a variety of interests and an interest in variety. How would we get people to agree to collaborate on projects in an organized fashion without threat or coercion? Well, I think that's the same answer as, as how do dogs get trained without shock collars? Through positive reinforcement, which if you've ever trained a dog, you know feels to the both of you a lot like play. Here in America, play isn't something that is valued or taken particularly seriously for humans, but play is vital for childhood development, and it doesn't stop being vital once you grow up. Think about how many adults you know who rely on video games or tabletop role-playing or fantasy football as creative outlets. Personally, you can find me at the pinball bar trying to win a free game once a week. Imagine a world where we had the time and infrastructure to put that pin-up creative energy to use outside of these quarantined, commodified spaces we currently call games. But how would you base a society on that? Why would anyone do anything they didn't want to do anything unsavory in a model that's based on curiosity instead of coercion. Who would take out the trash? Who would scrub the toilets? There's this account on TikTok I've been following for a few years. She's called Not the Worst Cleaner. She cleans intensely filthy homes, like hazmat suit biohazard level dirty, whose inhabitants for a variety of reasons are not able to clean themselves. And here's the kicker. She, she does it for free. You heard that right. I don't accept anything for these cleaning. And surprise, I'm not actually a cleaner for hire. My background is in psychology and I focus on the correlation between mental health and cleaning. When I started this account, it was just to share my knowledge and help people as best as I could while also motivating them. But after a few million followers, I felt like I could be doing so much more. I had people reaching out to me every single day for help who were struggling with their mental health and living in unlivable hoarder-like conditions. So I started fundraising to have cleaners go into these homes, however, got so many rejections and quickly realized these were not your typical cleanups, but instead hazmat cleanups, which can average $20,000 for 
for a large home. So a year and a half ago, I made the best decision of my life and started offering free cleanings to people who were really struggling and needed a fresh start. I share them here to help others in the same situation, to teach people how to begin cleaning when they don't know where to start, to help open eyes to mental health and learn compassion and understanding instead of judgment. Because there is always a deeper issue at play. People are not purposefully lazy. They are literally struggling to get through life. The videos I make show what depression looks like outside of the human body. And at the end of the day, all I want to do is help these people heal. Of course, she has accumulated a huge following and has gotten some sponsorships now, but that wasn't the case when she was starting out. And ever since she's popped off, I've been seeing more accounts doing what she's doing with follower accounts small enough that I know they're not getting paid, at least not substantially. I'm so inspired not only by the fact that Not the Worst Cleaner does this work, but by how gratifying she seems to find it, the meaning she seems to take from it, and the joy she experiences at seeing the relief on her clients' faces at this burden she's lifted off their shoulders. Let me ask you, do you think she would find this work, cleaning these houses, as meaningful and empowering if she worked for a steady paycheck at an industrial cleaning corporation and had a boss telling her she had to clean X amount of houses, scrub Y amount of floors for 40 plus hours a week? Play is always voluntary. What might otherwise be play is work if it's forced. The player get something out of playing. That's why he plays. But the core reward is the experience of the activity itself, whatever it is. In a ludic model of work, there will be no top-down coercion. But the more you give, the more you get. Put another way, a ludic model of work will be like good sex. Zack and Mary Make a Porno is a 2008 film written, directed, and edited by Kevin Smith, starring Elizabeth Banks and Seth Rogen. It is a lot like Elysium in that it is a not great movie that I personally think about a lot. I rewatched it recently for the first time in about 10 years. I liked it back then, and, and yeah, I still like it a lot now, I fear. One of the many problems with this movie is uh, the plot, which I will attempt to explain to you now, attempt being the operative word, because it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I, I do find its particular lack of sense to be quite charming. Zach works as a barista, and Mary works at a store in the mall. They're longtime best friends, they're roommates, and they're dead broke in Monroeville, Pennsylvania. One of the qualities that I really appreciate about this movie is that it was shot on location in Monroeville, and you can tell. Usually when we see poverty depicted in comedy, it's studio lot and Burbank poverty. It never feels lived in, and I think that's often by design. But to mimic the trappings of real poverty and ask your viewers who experienced it to then laugh at it, like, that's a tough ask. And I think the fact that Kevin Smith's more or less pulled it off here is commendable. Like, this house, I, I lived in this house back when I was surviving off of Amy's frozen lasagnas and Cool Ranch Doritos. I, I can smell the ancient gas stove. I recognize that wood trim and that is the wall decor my roommates would have picked out if they'd been into hockey instead of Midwest hardcore. Also, this movie literally feels so cold. The opening scene features Zach and Mary carpooling to work in a bald, tired, ice-covered car with no heat through mounds of dirty slush. I have lived this. And this isn't some exploitative poverty porn. Like, this isn't hillbilly elegy. Like, these people are poor, uh, but they also like each other and laugh and have fun. Kevin Smith has always been interested not just in work, but in unglamorous subsistence work. He consistently imbues his characters who do this kind of work with agency and intelligence and charm in a world that often expects them to be buffoons or drones or both. He even has the audacity to make them actively bad at their bottom of the ladder minimum wage jobs. You work in a video store! I work in a shitty video store. I want to go to a good video store so I can get a good movie. So given his track record, it does kind of make sense that he's made this for its time, surprisingly compassionate film about sex work. I feel like at this point I'm buttering the bagel pretty hard, like I sound like a Kevin Smith stan. I'm not really, although I think the way he depicts work is insightful and has generally aged well, like his jokes about race and queerness have not. And like most people, I find his newer stuff to be pretty unwatchable. I put on Clerks 3 on a whim the other day, and I had to watch it with my hands over my eyes like a horror movie. So yeah, back to Zack and Miri. They can't pay the bills, their power and water are cut off and they're facing eviction. And for reasons that are frankly a bit head scratching, Zach decides that the best way to become financially solvent is for him and Miri to produce and star in an adult film together. With this mailing list, we have almost a thousand people that would definitely buy a porno we were in just to be like, hey, I sit next to that guy in civics. 
question mark, question mark, question mark, profit. The logic just gets more cartoonish from there. And there's some noise about how Craig Robinson's character is financing the movie with the money he would have used to buy a 2008 flat screen, but the math ain't mathin'. Like, okay, so they do a casting call for the movie. And who are all these people in suburban Pennsylvania who want to perform in this amateur adult film pro bono? It does not make sense. I don't even think it's trying very hard to make sense. And that's sort of where it becomes magical, uh, almost speculative. We are asked to believe that these strangers adopt this passion project as their own, and the passion project is sex work. And what's remarkable is that the, the film never judges them for that. These people don't know each other when they begin working on this film, and the narrative focus is on Zack and Mary. The movie's a romance between them more than anything. Uh, but we get these little glimpses of how the side characters' relationships with each other are deepening, and we see from the time jump at the end that those relationships continue to mature and evolve past the end date of this project. At one point, they pool their money and connections together to pay off enough of Zack and Mary's delinquent bills to get their power and water turned back on, which in the film is framed not as a debt owed or as something Zack and Mary should be ashamed of, but as a cause for celebration, which is kind of radical. Like in fiction, if you think about how friends offering money to each other usually plays out, it, it's seen as a sign of moral weakness to accept. You're supposed to refuse, or if you don't, you're supposed to pay it back often with interest. But that's not how it's framed here. It's really framed as these people putting their resources together to lift each other up. They're saying this isn't just work. This is something much more important and honest than that. In today's media parlance, we'd call this found family. But what it really is, is, is community. Because this gesture paying their friends' bills is not charity. Because they do get something in exchange. They get each other. I'm not a policymaker or an organizer or even an activist, really. Like, I'm a person who likes to think about ideas and put them into words. My aim isn't to solve the problem of work, but to breathe life into the idea that it is a problem and allow that idea to take up as much space as it needs to in our lives and our conversations with each other and crucially in our art until we build something better and then beyond that. In the words of Murray Bookchin, the assumption that what currently exists must necessarily exist is the acid that corrodes all visionary thinking. Or put another way, as David Graeber says, the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make and could just as easily make differently. Who will scrub the toilets? Who will take out the trash? I'd propose we reframe that question. When my loved ones are suffering, who will clean for them? Who will care for them? I will. Why can't we expand that sphere? Why can't we extend the definition of loved ones to include an entire community, to include the entire planet? It seems exhausting now because most of us are work to the bone, but in a world without work, I believe we'd have the time. I want to bring it back to Sally Rooney and close out with my favorite quote from normal people. No one can be independent of each other completely, so why not give up on the attempt, she thought. Go running in the other direction. Depend on people for everything. Allow them to depend on you. Why not? I chose the worst day to film all day. There's been a helicopter circling my neighborhood. Are they looking for me? Thank you all so much for watching. I used to mainly make videos on TikTok, but I've been able to focus on more ambitious projects like this because of the incredible support of my patrons on Patreon, whose names are appearing before you now. For $3 a month, you too can have your name in my YouTube credits. But more interestingly, you'll gain access to one exclusive long form video from me per month. I don't phone these videos in. They're definitely shorter and more casual than this, but I take a tremendous amount of pleasure in, in making them. They become an important creative outlet for me because I'm doing them for an audience that's elected to follow me on an internet where unfortunately choosing to follow someone is mattering less and less in terms of the content you're actually seeing. Speaking of, uh, if you like my work and you want to make sure you actually see it and don't want to leave that up to an algorithm, please subscribe to my newsletter. If you subscribe, you'll get a monthly update on my projects and where to find me and what I've been working on directly in your inbox. And a very special thank you to my husband, Seth Thomas. He composed the kind of corporate hold music you heard over my title cards, and he's playing us out right now. This is his cover of Jason Isbell's Something More Than Free. And thank you also to our friend Adam Copeland, who did the mixing on that. Uh, he and Seth are in a band together. Uh, you can follow them on Instagram uh, at Zalem Official. They're cutting a record right now, and it's going to be really great. And I know that because they rehearse in my house. And yeah, if you made it all the way to the end, please like and follow for more, as the poets say. If you like this, I, I think you'll like what I have in store.